So the offense takes to the field Sunday in Atlanta, and the Falcons are really ready for this. They've got people plastered onto Pat Fryermuth. Double coverage, of course, on George Pickens. Lots of bigs on the field because they know the coach they're facing. They know the running game they're going to see. So who gets all that open grass? Who gets to capitalize? Good morning to you. Good Tuesday morning. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. Fun to even think that there's actually going to be football this week, right? But this is Daily Shot of Steelers. It comes your way bright and early every weekday morning. If you're into hockey and or baseball, I also offer daily shots of Penguins and Pirates in the same place that you found this. Kickoff will be at 1.02 p.m. inside Mercedes-Benz Stadium. I'll be there covering it, of course. And I'll be anticipating, kind of, to be honest with you, pulling for Calvin Austin to be a real thing in that game and beyond. My belief has been for quite some time that A, he hasn't really gotten much of a chance, and B, when he has, it hasn't necessarily been best usage. In other words, Matt Canada saw him as that guy who could take that pass across the middle, the only pass over the middle they'd throw to anybody, hit that one familiar seam up the middle, and there it would go. And otherwise, he just never saw the football. When in fact, Cal's strongest suit has always been his ability to break away when he finds that open grass. And that can come really close to the line of scrimmage. Now, he and I have talked about this, and, and he'll insist that versatility is one of his strengths, but he'll also acknowledge that the, the thing I just shared with you is what he'd love to be doing. He's the small in a sea of bigs. Roman Wilson is another player who's younger and who we know very, very little about. Cal's at least been around for a couple of years. Wilson's a rookie who really didn't even have a chance to partake in the preseason because of his injury. He's coming along fine now in practices. And I would imagine, I don't know this, but he should get a helmet Sunday in Atlanta. If he does, maybe he can contribute something similar. They're not identical players, and I don't mean to cast them as such, but they can be in that Same category as potential replacements for Deontay Johnson, and I think you can throw Van Jefferson in there as well as a depth option, depending on the number of wide receivers you can get onto the field. Have the Steelers replaced Deontay? No, of course not. Or, if I put it more accurately, not to our knowledge. Did they try to replace Deontay? (laughs) Yeah, we're kind of familiar with that one. Did they succeed? No. To date, they haven't. And they most definitely haven't as it relates to Brandon Ayuk. But here's a thought, as long as I'm spinning out hypotheticals for the final week in which hypotheticals will be needed. What if somewhere along the way, one or both of Austin and Wilson were able to rise up, were able to make enough plays that they could be WR2, or however it is that you would choose to designate them, given that the guy who's supposed to get the second most targets is actually a tight end, Pat Fryermuth. What if one or both were to be good? Not great, not even necessarily very good, just good. And what if that bought the Steelers the luxury of being able to wait between now and the NFL trade deadline? to see if they need to address the wide receiver position further. What if they used all of that cap space they'd been carving out for Ayuk on extensions, on upfront signing bonuses within those extensions that would allow them to sustain the huge cap space they've got waiting for them next year when they might be shopping for a quarterback? And what if, most important out of all of this, they're able to find a couple of real live football players, one or two, out of Austin and Wilson, when they might not have been able to do, no, no, not might not have been, they wouldn't have been able to do that at all. If your two wide receivers are Pickens and Ayuk, 
and you're going with a lot of two tight sets and you're getting Cordero Patterson out there and Connor Hayward, did, you're not even putting those kids on the field like ever. Look, I'm not taking anything back here. If the Steelers had gotten Ayuk, you would have heard me singing about it on here. I'm not a very good singer, but I would have given it a shot. So I'm not pretending otherwise now after the fact. I am and have been over the past few days, though, trying to think of it more from the Omar Khan perspective, where instead of accusing Omar Khan of having blown it or not having had a full plan or putting all his eggs into the Ayuk basket, I, I just don't see him as being that guy. He's so meticulous. He thinks so many steps ahead that there's no way that all of a sudden he became this simpleton who fixated on one guy who clearly isn't all that stable underneath his own helmet. There had to be more to the thought process. I believe there is more, and I genuinely believe that some combination of Austin and Wilson is part of that. When we come back, J1Q. This segment of Daily Shot is brought to you by our good friends at Mike's Beer Bar. They're located on Federal Street, directly across from PNC Park. Mike has more than 500 beers on tap, including from more than 50 local breweries. Stop in and say hello. Tell Mike we sent you. Mike's Beer Bar. Today's J1Q comes from Zach, who says, DK, I'm a young fan in my early 20s, and when I compare this team to Steelers of the recent past, I get a sense of dread. For example, if you pull the last team that won the Super Bowl, that being, of course, 2009, the roster looks so much better than today's. My question to you, DK, is if you honestly took this starting lineup and added them on to the 2009 Steelers, how many players would crack that one? In my opinion, T.J. Watt starts over Lamar Woodley. Cam Hayward starts over Travis Kersky. I sure hope so. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Maybe Joey Porter Jr. beats out Willie Gay. Minka Fitzpatrick over Ryan Clark. Other than that, in my opinion, the rest of the roster is either too close to say or in most cases clearly inferior. And I know that's a Super Bowl team, so obviously they're better. But should they really be so much clearly better? Am I being silly? Zach, you're not being silly. I am just really impressed, to be honest with you, dude, that you're a, how did you put it, young fan in my early 20s, and you're able to cite Travis Kersky, who was playing when you were like 10. But that also tells me that you, like a lot of football fans in our area, don't just watch the team that's in front of you. You embrace the history, you embrace the great players, whether that's of the recent past or the distant past, because the truth is, it's hard to be a Pittsburgh football fan without being able to talk at least peripherally about the 1970s. I'm not a big fan of when people obsess over talking about the 1970s, but it helps to be able to get the occasional Franco Harris, Rocky Blyer reference when you see two running backs in the same backfield. And also, and relevant, I can relate because I was really, really young when those teams were winning in the 1970s. But I could still match up names to a frightening amount of numbers. To your point, it seemed like you focused entirely on comparing the defense, since you didn't mention any offensive guys, even though you kept referring to the general team when citing the roster. So I'll stay on the defensive side as well. TJ's a superior player to even the peak version of Woodley, and I say that with respect for a guy that I knew pretty well back then and who was just a tremendous edge rusher when he was at his best. And I'll repeat with an additional laugh that Cam is better than Kershke. Minka versus RC is tough at safety because they're so different. We might as well not be talking about the same position. RC was... He was the old school safety who was going around taking people's heads off. Now, he also could play the position. He had a half of a season in which he might have been the team's overall best player. And think about who he was out there with for me to be saying that. 
So he did a lot more than headhunting as well. But I, I can't put him and Minka in the same sentence because Minka just Minka does more Troy than he does RC. Minka's the the freelancer, the wild card, the way Troy Palomalu was. But yes, of course, if you're talking about assessing them purely from the standpoint of who's the superior safety, it's Minka who's been regarded by some as the very best in the NFL. That's not a status that RC ever held. And I almost wish you would have taken it further because there are interesting comparisons between, say, Alex Highsmith and James Harrison. Yes, of course, Harrison is the superior player, but they also have kind of, kind of, Similar styles, sealing the edge, getting to the back when they can, occasionally some splash. But here, Zach, want me to give you something? I got something for you. If you want to get into what might actually be a difference, a positive difference for the 2024 defense versus the 2009 defense, with immense respect to all the gentlemen who were champions, and with a huge asterisk and acknowledgement here that They couldn't have had this trait if they wanted to, since it didn't exist in football back then. I'm looking at these inside linebackers with this group right now, and the way football is played right now, the way that position has been transformed more than any other on that side of the ball, and I'm saying that Patrick Queen and Peyton Wilson can make some things happen. They can make them happen in coverage. They can make them happen in pursuit. They can make them happen in terms of shutting off screens. And yeah, of course, they'd better be able to make them happen when it comes to defending the run. They can be really dynamic. I miss the Lawrence Timmons version of the position. But the fact is, it's not a thing anymore. LT could do a lot of different things. He was capable of his own sideline to sideline work. But when you're talking about speed and you're talking about someone specifically in in Wilson who's just a freak in that regard, if you have those guys freed up behind an effective Keanu Benton, who we're talking about different positions now, nose tackles changed almost as much. Casey Hampton to Benton, that's a different world. But one thing they both had to do, have to do, is stop the run. If this team, if this line can do its part in stopping the run and not letting it get to any second level, you can get those inside linebackers activated. You can get Nick Herbig onto the field maybe as a third inside linebacker in some form. You can make sure that Minka never, ever, ever has to step up there again. And you can create takeaways. Lots and lots of takeaways. And by the way, those takeaways won't look anything at all like the ones from 2009. They'll be generated in very different ways. Really good question. I appreciate that. I appreciate everybody listening to Daily Shot of Steelers. We will do another one of these tomorrow. 